I'm excited to be here. Today's fun, isn't it? Looks a little bit different, feels a little bit different. There's some exciting things that are happening in the service today. There's a, an exciting lunch after this. This is a fun Sunday morning. And to think to come to church and to be able to have this type of feeling and this type of atmosphere is great. And especially coming up off the heels of that video, you can sense the reason for celebration, can't you? You can sense the reason for celebrating because of what God has done amongst the bride here at Dry Run Church of Christ over the last 19 years, specifically just because of this space that we're in right now. And one of my favorite things about this morning so far has not only been able to catch up with some of you all and see some of you all, but to walk out into the foyer there and see some of the pictures that has taken place in the life of the church over the last 19 years and beyond. And so this morning... We take time to celebrate what God has done. Now, there's a place in Scripture that I think of and I think of celebration, and it comes from the book of Joshua. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me uh, to Joshua chapter 3. That's where we will be camped out here this morning. And as we're thinking about what it means to celebrate, and we think about what it means to have this posture of celebrating and thankfulness towards God, I think of Joshua and the Israelites. And as we Jump into Joshua chapter 3. I think it's important for us to be reminded of what's taking place in the history of the Israelites leading up to this point. See, prior to Joshua, there was a leader amongst the Israelites, and his name was Moses. Do you remember Moses? Do you remember what Moses was, was known for? Moses was known for what? Leading God's people out of Egyptian captivity. They were slaves in Egypt. So Moses goes to Pharaoh, and he pleads for Pharaoh to let God's people go. And then there's a series of plagues that come. And then finally, Pharaoh releases the Israelites, and Moses leads the Israelites out of Egypt. And as they're coming out of Egypt, they get to this wall. It's a water wall. They come to the Red Sea. They're stuck. They can't go any further. They're at the Red Sea, and then they feel this presence behind them. It's the Egyptian army coming up behind them, and now they're in between a a wall of water behind them and an Egyptian army behind them. And the Israelites are fearful. And I love this phrase in the story where God tells them, he says this, the Lord will fight for you. The Lord will fight for you. All you need to do is be still. Don't you love that phrase? The Lord will fight for you. All you need to do is be still. And then God tells Moses to raise his staff, and as he raises his staff, the waters of the Red Sea part. There's a wall on the left and a wall on the right, and the Israelites walk through on dry ground. And after they walk through on dry ground, they go to the other side, and then they begin this journey in the desert for 40 years. They're literally walking in a circle for 40 years where there's this pruning that takes place, where they're understanding what it means to be in relationship with God, understand what it means to rely on Him. And it's during this time where they actually form as a people group for the first time. They get the Ten Commandments. They get other laws to understand what it means to be in relationship with God. And then they get on the brink of what was promised to them, the promised land. As they're on the brink of this promised land, Moses passes the baton off to Joshua, and then Joshua begins to lead the Israelites into the promised land. But first they find themselves in a very similar situation as Moses and the Israelites did 40 years prior. They come up to a wall of water. And the water is the Jordan River, and that's what we're going to pick up in Joshua chapter 3. Joshua chapter 3, the Israelites are there in front of the wall of water, and we see this in verse 11, where it says that, Joshua 3 verse 11 says, The ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe, and as soon as the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot, In the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. 
God tells Joshua, I'm going to do again what I did before. Don't you love that when God says that? I'm going to do again what I did before. And this time, instead of, instead of Moses' staff parting the waters, it's going to be led by the presence of God, by the power of God. The Ark of the Covenant. In the Old Testament, the Ark of the Covenant was hosted in this most holy of holy places in the tabernacle. And it was on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant, known as the mercy seat. On this lid of the Ark of the Covenant is where God's presence would rest. And so now God says the Ark of the Covenant is going to lead the way through parting of the waters of the Jordan. The scene is set. Joshua gives the command to the people. In verse 14 we pick up, it says, Soon, as, soon when the people heard this, they broke camp to cross the Jordan. The priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priest who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan. While the water flowing down to the Sea of The Arabah, that is the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over. We can't miss this. The people, remember this, crossed over opposite Jericho. The priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed crossing on dry ground. God does the miraculous again. And the whole Israelite camp walks through on dry ground. And in this time... After they've crossed the Jordan, this time they said, okay, we're going to take time to celebrate. See, the first time when they crossed the Red Sea, they went on as business as usual. They crossed the Red Sea, and they went straight into the desert, and actually they started complaining. Joshua says, no, not this time. When we we cross this Jordan River, we're going to take time to celebrate. Here's what we know. What you celebrate says a lot about you. What you celebrate says a lot about you. Do we celebrate the ways that God works in our lives? You know, it's easy to recognize when the waters part in our lives, so to speak, doesn't it? The big ways that God works, but he works in the small ways as well. And do we celebrate those? Because what we celebrate says a lot about us. It goes on in verse 1 of chapter 4. It says, when the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests are standing, and carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the 12 men that he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and he said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord and to the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone On his shoulder, according to the number of tribes of the Israelites, to serve as a sign among you. Listen to this next verse now. In the future, when your children ask, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones... These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. To celebrate what God has done, the leaders of the church take on the hard work of going down into the riverbed of the Jordan, rolling up their sleeves, digging out these stones, stones so large, they're not pebbles now, stones so large that they have to throw them on their shoulder. And they come up out of the Jordan, and they plant these stones on the ground, and they say, these stones are to be a memorial. They are to be a reminder of the way that God works among his people. To celebrate, you lay down stones. You lay down stones, and you say, these stones represent the way that God works in my life, the way that God works in my family, the way that God works in my community. And for the Israelites, it was in the way that God works with the fullness of the church. You lay down stones and you say these stones represent the glory of God and what God can do. So they come up out of the Jordan and they plant these big stones that they, work, they had to work hard to get. 
In verse 18, it says this, after they plant the stones, the priest came up out of the river carrying the Ark of the Covenant. No sooner had they set their feet on dry ground than the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and ran at flood stage as before. Jump down to verse 20, it says, And Joshua set up at Gilgal the 12 stones that they had taken out of the Jordan. And he said to the Israelites, here it is again, In the future, when your descendants ask their parents, what do these stones mean? Tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. These stones are to be a memorial, a reminder of the way that God works. And when people in future generations, when they ask, what do these stones mean? You simply point them to God. Show them what God has done. Show them how God works. Church, that's how you celebrate. You lay down stones. This morning, we come in a spirit of celebrating as well. And we celebrate the way that God has worked amongst the people of Dry Run for the last 19 years, particularly in this building right here where we are sitting. And as we celebrate, I can't help but wonder, I can't help but think, over the last 19 years, we heard some of that in the video, of what the vision, what the dream would take place here on this ground. I can't help but wonder, over the last 19 years, how many people heard about the saving message of Jesus? How many people heard about the grace of Jesus? And how many people gave their lives over to him and were baptized in this room? I wonder how many people have come here in this room, heard an encouraging message from the word of God, and their lives were changed. I wonder how many prayers have been prayed in this room over the last 19 years. How many people have come on a Sunday morning to be encouraged spiritually, by the word of God in being with other people who recognize the power in the word of God. Other people who are in the same journey of following Jesus together and have come with a burden on their heart, come through a difficult time, and they needed to be with their church family and they received prayer. How many prayers have been prayed? How many kids have come in this room like many are sitting right now, either through Uh, a week of VBS or a night of candy in the car or any other thing that's taken place. How many kids have come in this room and heard the simple message that God is for you, that God is with you, that God cares about you, that God loves you? You know, out there in the the foyer, there's some pictures, and we have one of them here this morning, pictures of of different stages of the church. This was uh, the first Sunday worship service that took place in this room. Maybe you see yourself there. Maybe you recognize that um, maybe things look a little bit different. Maybe you look a little bit different than you did 19 years ago. I know that could be said about some of us. You know, it's interesting. I look at this picture and I think of all that has taken place in this room over the last 19 years and really all that has changed in the last 19 years in this room. Maybe there's some people in that picture that you can look at and say, okay, well, they're not with us right now. I look at people in that picture, a part of my family, that they're no longer with us as they were 19 years ago. And here's what it took. Here's what it took for Dry Run Church of Christ to be the strong bride that she is today. It took people willing to answer the call that God placed on their lives. It took people willing to be stretched in ways that they'd never been stretched before. It took people to take steps of faith that they had never taken such giant steps of faith before. It took people giving sacrificially like they never gave before for the bride to be as strong as she is today. There's a part in Joshua's story at the beginning of Joshua chapter 3 that I love. And Joshua tells the people, he says, listen, Prepare yourself. This is before they crossed the Jordan, before they took their first step of faith. He says, prepare yourself. Joshua chapter 3, verse 5 says, prepare yourself because the Lord will do amazing things among you. Now think about all the amazing things that have taken place here. It took people willing to answer the call of being faithful God placed on their hearts. 
You know, people that have laid down stones, they said, okay, we're laying down these markers of faith so when generations come, they'll know the goodness of God. There's actually a stone, believe it or not, uh, that is here in the church because this has been, this has been the mantra of driving around Church of Christ not only for the last 19 years but really since its conception. There's a stone that has been planted here at the church, at the front of the church. It, there at the beginning, there's a plaque that reads this. It says, Drive Around Church of Christ, organized 1930, built here 1985. For the last 92 years, people have been laying down stones of faith, these markers that say, this is what God can do in my life, this is what God can do in our community, and this is what God can do in the life of the church. For 92 years, people have answered the call of leadership. I can think of some people that have walked through the, do- the, the hallways of this church and through the doors of this church that have been pillars of the faith that had laid down stones so that people will know the goodness of God. Maybe you're thinking of some people right now in your mind. There's some people that I'm thinking of. I think of Ray and Dot Hill. I think of Charlie Carter. I think of Wilma Smith, Don and Mary Journey, Elmer and Lorraine Shepard, Gibb and Faye Kamer. And there, church, there's many more that we could list, isn't there? You're thinking of some people right now in your mind. There's many more that we could list because people said, okay, I'll, we'll roll up our sleeves. We'll do, the, we'll do the hard work. We'll go and grab these stones and place them on our shoulders, and we'll put them down on the ground, plant them in the ground so that when future generations come, they will know the goodness of God as well. Now, you know the obvious transition here. Whenever you reflect on the past, whenever you reflect on how God has worked in the past, What's the obvious transition? You have to look ahead to the future. You have to anticipate the future. Our question this morning is simple. Who's going to lay a stone down for the next generation? Who's going to lay down a stone for the next generation? Who in this room will say, okay, I'll answer the call of leadership. I'll answer the call of obedience. I'll answer the call of faithfulness. And I'll lay down a stone as a marker of my faith for my family, a marker for the faith family here at Dry Run Church of Christ. You know, it's not easy work. It's hard work to to take on that call. Actually, it requires a lot out of you. And I can, th- I can think of three very practical things that it would require out of you to lay down a stone as a marker of faith. One, it'll take this. It'll take being Bible engaged. It'll take being Bible engaged. There's this, there's this um, organization called the American Bible Society, and they put out an annual report every year. It's called the State of the Bible. You can look this up. It's called the State of the Bible. And every year they put out this report, and they, they use this phrase, people who are Bible engaged. And here's what we've learned. Reading the Bible and engaging with the Bible is a lost art amongst Christians today. See, they put out this report every year and they say, this is the state of the Bible. And and each year it kind of fluctuates a few points. In 2022, it took a nosedive. Not just amongst people in in America, but even amongst Christians. It took a nosedive. People that are Bible engaged dropped 21% in the last year. Where it fluctuated a percent or two, it dropped to 21% in the last year. The only category that grew were people who were Bible disengaged. I think it's time to reflect, church, what is it that I'm reading? Am I reading the Word of God? Which is the only thing, think about this now, it's the only thing on the entire earth that is promised to be eternal. Am I reading the Word of God, or am, I, or am I scrolling through something, filling my head with junk in a world where I need to be more in tune with God's Word than ever before? 
And the most interesting thing about the State of the Bible report is that they constantly say this, and it was proven again this year, is that people who engage with the Word of God on a regular basis are emotionally more encouraged and spiritually more encouraged. People who engage in the Word of God are emotionally more encouraged in their everyday life and spiritually. They have more of a positive outlook on life. It'll take being Bible engaged. Two, it'll take this. It'll take erring on the side of grace. Remember that phrase, err on the side of grace. Because here's what happens in our world, and we see this, you know this, what do people, what do people lead with? They lead with judgment. They lead with being critical. They lead with always pointing out what's wrong. Listen, I know Jesus. I know Jesus was full of grace and full of truth. But Jesus is perfect. We are not perfect. And if we're going to be on wrong, wrong on one side of the other, church, let's be wrong on being too gracious. People, people lead with what they call their truthfulness, but their truthfulness comes across a little bit more critical. If we're going to be wrong on something, let's be wrong on being too gracious. It's interesting, as we look throughout the New Testament, as we look at the fruits of the Spirit, we never see the, the terms uh, critical or judgment there, do we? What's the first fruit of the Spirit? The fruits of the Spirit are love. That's the first fruit. So let's err on the side of grace. The third thing is this. It's going to take giving to God more than we do the world. It will take giving to God more than we do the world. Now, this means more than just finances, but yes, it does include finances. We can't be so tight in our budget, spending on things that don't matter, spending money on stupid things, or trying to project an image where we can't be faithfulness in our giving. To be able to, to see an empty field and say, okay, this is what we believe God will do, it took some financial stewardship. It took people giving sacrificially. And even alongside finances, giving to God more than we do the world means giving of our time and our commitment. Where your feet are reveals where your commitments are. That's a phrase I learned. Where your feet are reveals where your commitments are. And just like Bible engagement has gone down in 2022, so has church attendance. And I think those two go hand in hand, don't they? There was this uh, phrase before COVID that people used. They said that uh, 20% of the people in the, in the church, 20% of the people did 80% of the work. Post-COVID, the reality of that is 10% of the people do 90% of the work. So the question maybe we can ask God is this, okay, where is it that you could be leading me to take on a position of servanthood? And ask the difficult questions. Where does my feet tell me about my commitment? Those are three things that will require someone to lay down stones. It will lead them to be Bible engaged. It will lead to err on the side of grace. And it will lead to give to God more than we do the world. Jesus is the one that teaches us that. He says, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Now, as we think about Joshua, Joshua says, the Lord will do amazing things among you. What was so amazing about what God did? What was so amazing about what God did? Was parting the waters the amazing thing that God did? Actually, I'm not so sure it was. I'm not so sure parting the waters of the Jordan was the amazing thing that God did. God already did that before. He did it when he parted the Red Sea. The amazing thing wasn't that God parted the waters. The amazing thing is where God parted the waters. Do you remember that? I said, don't forget this, where God parted the waters. He parted it right across from Jericho. Where they would take their first step into the promised land. The Israelites cross through. The waters part right across from Jericho. And they lay down these big stones. They lay down these big stones to reflect on the, what God has done the way that God got them through the waters. They celebrate what God had done, but they also lay down these stones and they get a front row seat to look ahead at what God can do. 
They laid down the stones and they can reflect on the way that God worked and what God did. But then they also could see ahead of them with anticipation and the way that God would work. And the battle that would then ensue with Jericho. See, it wasn't necessarily that God parted the waters was was the amazing thing, but but where they could reflect on what would happen behind them and they got to anticipate what could be ahead of them. Church, we find ourselves in that same position today. This morning we get to celebrate the way that God has worked with this body, with this church community here over the last 19 years, particularly in this room. We get to celebrate the way that God is part of the waters over the last 19 years. We're also laying down these big stones to look ahead and anticipate what God will do next. Because every time God works, it's always accompanied with something that God will do next. So our question, again, is this. Who's going to lay down stones so that the next generation that comes will see the goodness of God? Would you pray with me?